Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Anurag Mishra, and uh, I'm the founder of Livonics Institute of Integrated Learning and Research, where we focus on both disruptive as well as integrated learning and research. Uh, one of my one of my favorite philosopher, Alan Watts, once said that problems that remain persistently insoluble should always be suspected as questions asked in the wrong way. So at Livonics Institute of Integrated Learning and Research, we focus on asking questions and finding answers through the simultaneous use of multiple lens, much like going to an optometrist and getting your vision corrected. We believe that we see clearer when we add on the lens of different disciplines to the pre-existing one, and then much like going to the optometrist, you know, you sometimes see the writing on the wall. Our ambition is not to be a Coursera or a Brilliance or a, you know, something or the other academy on the internet, but to convey what has been learned by teachers who have developed a new interdisciplinary way of understanding their field and have brought that understanding into practice to produce better results than before. So our, the pillars of our institute are essentially transdisciplinary, we are transnational, but we are also always transitional because we always try to make the transition from theory to practice to produce a new understanding as well as a practice, which should ultimately result, give better results. If it doesn't give better results, there's no point in having better understanding. So we offer a bunch of, we just started and we offer a bunch of courses with the opportunity for people who attend our courses to join our team and to work with us if they can still tolerate us at the end of the course. So, we offer seven courses right now, They're all uh, very different, but yet the thing which is common to them is that they're all transdisciplinary in a way. Uh, one course is psychiatry as clinical neuroscience, uh, taught by Dr. Bhaskar Mukherjee, who I saw signed on somewhere, which is a combination of psychiatry and uh, molecular medicine. Second is psychoanalysis in practice between philosophy and neurobiology, which is led by Professor Anup Dhar, whom you see on the screen. It is a combination of many things, psychoanalysis, uh, neurobiology, philosophy, and also neuromedicine. The third course is Life and Leadership Coaching, offered by Suparna Banerjee, which combines the theory of leadership and coaching with, psychoanal with the study of psycho with the psychoanalytic study of organizations. Another course, the fourth course is design thinking or thinking in design offered by uh, Joy Banerjee. It is on the philosophy and practice of design thinking. Then there is intellectual property in business offered by Rodney Ryder, whom also I suspect I saw somewhere here. Then by Rajat Chaudhary offers a course. Rajat Chaudhary is a leading author of climate science fiction. He offers a course in creative writing. And finally, uh, is movement medicine, the course offered by Dr. Rajat Chauhan. He's a man of uh, many accomplishments and degrees. I will not count them all here. Uh, he's the creator of the eighth circle of hell, the <laughs> La Ultra, the eighth circle of hell, I suspect. <laughs> I think it's probably the toughest race on earth, but I wouldn't want to find out personally. Um, he, a man and a race on whom at least, at last count, five movies had been made. I may have missed one or two along with Bill Andrews, who featured in at least one, if not two, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, a doctor specializing in sports medicine, 
who has collected as many degrees as medals in his lifetime. He has engaged with pain personally, running challenging distance since childhood, and professionally, you know, helping countless patients, whom among whom I am to be counted, uh, deal with debilitating pain, through which he has distilled his own method of conquering or at least dealing with pain and running and really running. I will not go into the details of uh, his many degrees and accomplishments from medicine to osteopathy to so many others, but I suspect you will get a better grasp of him through his own lecture. So Rajat, up to you now. Thank you, Anurag. Uh, so guys, uh, what I'll do is I'll just explain some people might, might just be joining and, you know, I'll just start with first a little background about, you know, why me? Uh, why in a program like me? Why at Livonix me? Um, so very simply put, I'm the most fun guy out of the seven people he has. I'm the eighth. <laughs> so, uh, so very important to know that part. But um, uh, what's, what's important again is, I'm sorry, I'll just click on this thing. Yeah. Uh, I'll just tell you or talk you through like uh, what all I've been up to and why me here. So I started off running as a nine-year-old. Okay, that's a very important part of the story. And as a nine-year-old in a boarding school, I was running. And uh, the very first morning, it's a it's a school with a very big background heritage of running. I mean, that's instilled in all students. So the very first morning, nine-year-old, uh, when I just woke up and everyone was rushing to the field and I was like, what's happening? And I didn't know and landed up with them on the field. And then everyone started running and so did I. And then I was coming last because I was new to the place. And I was like, I don't know what's this all about. Uh, and suddenly out of the blue, there was a cane on my butt. Uh, so at first I didn't even realize what it was. It was, there was sharp pain in the, you know, the uh, thigh area. And then I figured that the PE teacher had just hit me on my butt or backside. And uh, like, so why in the morning? I'm come on, I'm just a child and why in the morning this? And he made a very interesting statement. He said, you look like someone who can be coming better than last. Why don't you come second last? And that's been an interesting story for me. That's been the biggest part of the journey for me saying, if you can do more, why not more? It doesn't have to be the best, but why not that tiny one a little bit more? Uh, and that's where this whole thing that, uh, uh, Anurag was alluding to about the pain bit. Uh, that's been a part of me for a very long time, that how dealing with pain, uh, you can make a friend out of it if you start loving what you're doing, or you don't have to conquer, conquer, but you need to learn how to live with it because most of the times we're lying when, I tell, when we tell our patients that it'll be gone forever. In chronic pain, you need to kind of appreciate it, get on with it, start living better. And the world changes for you. And without realizing there was psychology at play, even as a nine year old. And from there, I picked up running. And every weekend or fortnight, we used to have a race of top six people getting a fruit drink. Our pocket money used to be 25 rupees and two rupees used to be the fruit drink. Uh, so it was a mango maza kind of a thing or a slice kind of a drink that was there. Now, suddenly you could have won four rupees when 25 rupees is all that is your pocket pocket money for the month. So from the cane, it was to pleasure that you were moving towards. And that's a very important part because, you know, people talk to you about the exercise psychology and the sports psychology, and people will tell you that exercise is good for you. Uh, most people don't carry on doing an exercise because it's healthy. It has to be fun. And to me, that maza was fun. That fruit was fun. So hence that running became like a hobby, like a, my best love or my love of that time uh, has been ever since. It understands me like no one's ever has. It's always there for me. It doesn't actually ever measure me by uh, or judge me by have I won a medal or not? Have I finished a race? Did I get up a particular morning or not? And that's what my relationship with running has been since then, since the age of nine. And then I picked it up seriously. In the boarding school, we used to be given running as a punishment. You're supposed to run 200 meters, 400 meters and stuff like that. And what was interesting for me was they never realized that I never took it as a punishment. Okay, it was fun for me. Uh, so I would just run and I would very happily carry on with it. 
uh, I got one scanning for having smiled in the class. Uh, I was in class eight and I was smiling for some silly reason that, you know, 13 year old child would smile for. And uh, my class teacher, you know, just said, why are you smiling? And I told her like some five times she asked me and five times I told her no, 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 no reason, nothing really. And she said, no, if you don't have a reason, you're smiling, you're mad. And she's repeated that some five, six times. And I was really getting embarrassed. And I was like, ma'am, you know what? Maybe I'm mad. And uh, she got all red. And uh, that teacher happened to be from China in any case. She was a Chinese teacher. Um, so <laughs> uh, without any racism or anything like that, her cheeks just went red, totally red. Uh, and as luck would have it, the headmaster uh, happened to be her husband. And she said, you know, take this guy to the headmaster and get him best of six. Now, best of six was effectively the worst or the hardest canes you can get on your butt uh, and back to back. All right. So it kind of pretty awesome, awful stuff. So I got caning for having smiled. Okay. And best of six at that. And there's a long story I can tell you some other time, but yeah, just to rush it up right now. So I, caning for having, smoked, you know, just smiled. Now that was my interesting thing about, you know, how running and pain and, you know, how things were going on. And I wanted to pick up running as a carrier, landed up in a medical college because middle-class families, you don't run way back at least in 90s. You know, it was like, what are you talking about? Uh, so I ended up in a medical college. Advantage I had over my colleagues and my peers who were always busy with their, uh, you know, passing exams and coming first and whatever. I knew what the body was capable of doing more. They were busy with sickness and illness. They were busy with pathology. I was interested in the physiology part of it. And by default, uh, because that's where my heart uh, lay, right? It was about how can you do more? Uh, not necessarily putting hard work, but some strategy behind it. And how do you deal with it? And again, as I, I repeat myself, without knowing that I knew psychology, because I was doing it on my own, uh, and psychology in a medical college is barely there. You know, you would have more psychology in a forensic medicine class than actually in a psychiatry class, for example. So mind doesn't, isn't given enough importance, but I kind of knew because of my own running, like how important that part is. So that became very interesting without even me knowing about it. Uh, so I ended up doing my medicine and I was like, you know, now what do I do with this degree that I have? I ended up doing sports medicine because that was the only thing that was making sense. And I was asked like, why sports medicine? Uh, because nothing else, nothing else was adding up. And this was from Nottingham. Uh, luckily had one of the best mentors I could have had. Uh, he was that time the chief medical officer for the English cricket team. So I got involved with the English team and I was doing some cricket stuff, uh, research and stuff. Uh, ended up going to South Africa with him. Uh, this is 2004, three, 2003 Cricket World Cup. Um, and then running, I was just picking up again. Then I ended up doing osteopathy uh, that uh, Narag was alluding to. Now, why I like talking about these three degrees is I was going in reverse order. Most people who end up doing medicine, they, it becomes a second degree for them. They could have done a Bachelor of Science and then do an MBBS or something or an MD. And here I was, I was doing an academic degree after having done a clinical degree, an MBBS, then an MSc in sports medicine. And then the third degree, even more interesting, it was, um, you know, com uh, very, very different way of going, approaching it. I was doing uh, osteopathy. Now, this is different from your traditional osteopathy because it's a medical osteopathy. It's only for doctors. And the intake is three to five doctors. But you get to think about simple things that we doctors don't appreciate enough, like how are you talking to your patient? How are you listening to your patient? Are you touching them uh, with your heart or your, you know, your uh, heart or hand or, or your heart? And uh, could you learn to know what you don't know? You know, we guys are not taught that in a medical college. So it was about simplifying things. It was giving more importance to the patient because what happens in a medical college soon enough our empathy starts going, you know, starts going down very quick when we start seeing patients. And it's very high when we're seeing cadavers. Very interesting the way the system is. But I was reintroduced to that whole thing about saying, you know, listen, your patients are very important. Pay attention to listening to them and touching them and feeling them. Uh, so it was going to the basic again. And I'm glad that I ended up doing that order. And that happened because I was at a football match or a hockey match or whatever it was. And there was a situation where I was the guy who was supposed to take care of the match. 
And luckily, Peter Gregory, my mentor in sports medicine, was right there. And he said, uh, I asked him, like, what do I do? Because, um, you know, with hands, I can't do much. Uh, I've not been trained in it. And here is this guy who's got injured, and I'm supposed to be the, you know, the sports doctor for the event. And he was like, you know, you need to do this course. And hence, I did osteopathy. Then after that, and why I'm actually saying all this is because that's what I bring to the whole course as well. I was the medical doctor or uh, the head for a London center for a chain called Kieser Training. Now, Kieser Training used the technology, the hardware was used from the founder of uh, Medex, Arthur Jones. And he then came up with, uh, before Medex, he had... Uh, Mm, whatever that machines before that he was doing. I, I'm forgetting the name right now. It'll come to me. Anyways, but very, very state of the art. I mean, the guy, Arthur Jones, cutting edge of strength training. All right. We're talking about high intensity training, which is today the you know, very popular term. We're talking about 60 years ago. The guy was talking about and working on that then. So getting a very close, you know, like in that small little you know, group and be part of it and to head that department. Uh, and where the role was of how do you use strength to get people better. Now, Kieser Training was a Swiss German chain of rehabilitation centers, and they used to use a term, or the tagline was strong back knows no pain. Now, a very German statement, uh, because we doctors know that you can have a very strong back and yet you can have a lot of pain. Uh, what they didn't appreciate maybe, when someone comes in with pain and you put them in a machine and you make them do strength training, you're actually empowering them. You're empowering them. You're making them proactively involved in the treatment, which otherwise our treatments are not about. Now, just be that, I've had three degrees. Now I'm working and I'm now learning something, all right? Uh, the three degrees didn't give me that, okay? So I was having a sports medicine degree, my second degree. I did not know anything about strength training. I did not know about its role in rehabilitation. And we're talking about 20 years ago, all right? Uh, and it was fascinating how powerful strength training is. And it's not the strength itself. It's the strength of the mind and the body together, right? It's about saying, I'll fix it, you know? And we would make those people sit on the, uh, those machines and do those very basic movements, back and forth or whatever. Simple movements, very amazing state-of-the-art machines. Our philosophies were very simple. There was a small little book you were supposed to read. And, uh, you know, you would be part of the team. Uh, the team that was there, my therapists, my trainers, weren't trained officially in those degrees at all. So no one cared at Kieser if you were a physical therapist, if you were a trainer or any of that. If you were passionate, and that's the main thing here, if you were passionate about it, it was game on. They wanted you on board, right? And uh, they weren't asking you to read forever. And this is the important part about the course as well that I'm offering here. I'm not wanting to read the crazy amount of books that, you know, I've read and how thick they are, you know, all are size of the Bible and bigger, um, you know, and um, you can use them for pillow, I think. That's about it. It's the important part in it is or you very, can very... use them to prop up your computer as I am doing right now. <laughs> Same here. Same. High level. I've got three of them below this. Same here. <laughs> so that's, that's exactly what they're used for, really. Because all of us, if we go back to our you know, what we studied in school and, you know, or college and how much are we applying? Uh, not much. Just that we don't know which part we'll end up applying. That's the important part again. All right. So it's easier complaining about it, but uh, we don't know which part we'll end up use, using or not. So what I would want to be doing the, in this program is I'll touch on a few things and uh, then it'll be fun. It'll not be about passing exam, but that's the theory part of it. And Kiza has a very important role to play, you know, how to train people. Uh, they've done a phenomenal job of that. Uh, 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 an anecdote from there, to pass or to be part of the system, their headquarters used to be in Cologne and uh, Germany. And you would go there, you would write that exam. They would tell you to read a small little book like this big, cover to cover, you were supposed to read it. The exam would happen. And if you were a German, you had to have 90% to pass. It was an MCQ exam. So if you get 90% or more, only then you're in as a German. As an English, I think it was 75% because the, the, I was told by the Kieser training people that, listen, English people are stupid. Um, 90 is too much to expect from an Englishman. <laughs> like, okay, I mean, up to you guys. Uh, luckily, I fell into the 75 or 70% thing. 
Um, they didn't have any category for India because India, normally we have a 50 percent pass percentage. Uh, our board exams have 33 pass percentage, right? So let's not get into that part at all. <laughs> Where do we fall versus the English and the Germans then? So that was a, that's a very important part when it comes to training. Like, you know, how should training be? How, how, what should you expect from people who are going to learn something from you? So passion becomes very important. Simple becomes very important because Kiza training was about simple things and repetition. You know, you repeat things till you kind of it becomes a habit. One thing that's important with repetition is repetition doesn't make it perfect. Repetition makes it permanent. So you need to make sure that what you're learning is right or close to right. Uh, the thing is with science and knowledge, they're evolving all the time. So right at a certain time. And that's where someone like me comes in saying, listen, just do these things and we'll do it basic. We'll keep doing it till you get it right. Or at least what we're, what we're trying to do. A simple example is what is running about? Running, running is left and right, left and right. And uh, no one can teach you how to run. Uh, it's a basic instinct. Even before we were born, we were running. Okay, we were moving our legs, you know, that uh, when the kicks were happening, we, we do that, right? Uh, we know about that. Even before we were born, by the way, uh, we were running, all right? At, before even the uh, conception happened, uh, that, you know, whatever the sperm did and all that. So it's even before that, that running is just integral to being human, right? The thing I'm trying to tell you is running can't be taught. Running can be relearned because when we sit for very long, we've forgotten how to move. Right? So we've forgotten the very basic thing that we were, you know, should, should have been a very basic instinct. So that will be an integral part that I'll be taking you through, like, you know, how to do simple things. Pain. Now, pain is an integral part of it because what happens is we want to be in status quo because when we move, it's uncomfortable. And uncomfortable is not what we want to be. The problem is if you keep it at status quo, it'll just break down any sudden, you know, any random day. Whereas if you start moving, maybe there'll be pain first few days, but once you get into space, uh, it'll surprise you how it is amazingly good at connecting with your deepest self. I forget about how many kilometers you run and uh, how fast you run. So that'll be an integral part of the whole program, how we'll go, go ahead with it. Now, just going forwards in my journey. Now, while I was in London again, uh, I started doing courses every fortnight, every weekend, because London was amazing for me because you would get the best brains coming down and, you know, there could be uh, Alexander Technique course happening. There could be taping program happening and, you know, Pilates and whatever, yoga for back pain, you know, things like that. The world's best would come along and do these weekend programs and all. I would jump from anywhere to anywhere, injecting cadavers. I mean, why not, you know, uh, uh, inject some cadavers as well. So it was fascinating because that's when I gave up injecting totally because I realized if you're not doing it under supervision, if you don't have a C-arm and stuff like that, when that injection goes in, and that's what our expert doctors were doing back then, you basically, you have no idea where that injection is, where that needle is, all right? And you're injecting blind effectively. And I was like, why am I doing this then? So I gave up on my, I learned that. And then I was like, okay, this is the thing not to do. And I think that's one very important part about learning. If you kind of just figure what not to do, that's a amazing learning. So... I was doing all those programs and I learned that it's not the number of degrees. It's not about how experienced someone is. I think it's about going out there and whoever is ready to teach you to learn from them. I was learning from nurses. I was learning from physios. I was learning from coaches. I gate analysis. Uh, there were running stores. I don't know if they do it still. Runners need. They used to do gate analysis in a running store, which is far better than even today offered in most places. So they would do on the treadmill, they would make you run outside, run and, run and become uh, one of my favorite stores in London. Even back then, uh, 20 years ago, they would make you run on the street and they would, looking at it, they would tell you what shoe do you need, what do you need to change with your running gait, how should you be, what exercise to be doing. These are people who are not physios, they were not coaches, coaches, they were not doctors at all, and they were telling people how to do it better. Now, how can you not learn from those people? And that's the beauty about learning. I think you need to be just ready to learn and there's a lot of learning to be done. And it was a lot of fun, you know, to pick up small little things like this from all over the place. Came back, I came back to Manipal Hospital, uh, Bangalore, or they got me back actually. And funny story because I was part of the Olympic committee. I was getting, not committee, but uh, I was helping some athletes, especially the sprinters, 
the junior squad and the you know the senior ones one of the girls ended up winning the world championships and uh, the olympics and the euro cup and all that stuff euro uh, gold medal in that 400 meters but i was dealing with folks like that uh, the manipal people came because mbbs had done with them and uh, they were like you know uh, uh, commonwealth games are going to be coming to india so we would love to have you here i mean who does that from olympics i upgraded myself to commonwealth games so obviously they're bigger so <laughs> i was with manipal i was with manipal for a few years uh, heading their department at that time we were definitely a state of the art uh, most people are bragging about it today we were doing it 2006 uh, the stuff that we were doing then most people don't do it even today uh, the term sports medicine became popular because of commonwealth games anyone who had seen any sport person was suddenly a sports medicine doctor i mean why not uh, and and i've always said that someone like me is basically like a gatekeeper like a receptionist uh, who kind of tells you where to go uh, and that's a big job you know you're triaging almost because our field has become very super specialized uh, which is very sad actually if you think about it uh, so sports medicine person is supposed to be like a generalist who should know all of it and then saying okay and my specialty being pain out of it saying okay pain how can i help you with that and so i was with manipal again back pain was interesting because consultants would come to me but they would never ever refer any patients and that's been a very interesting learning as well and that's again something that i want to be very integral when i'm you know talking to you guys they would come for their pains neck pain back pain they won't refer because that was bad for business uh and what i'm really trying to do with this course is how proactively you can be learning how to be more happy doing carrying on with life how to perform better how to pick up running um the things that i want to touch about is uh, so it could be this part where you want to become better where you want to deal with pain and all that stuff but also if you are a potential medical student you want to do medicine or physiotherapy or you want to be picking up elite athletes athletics or sports if you don't know that 25% of bones in are in your feet uh you have a problem there okay so so effectively you'll never be told like that because you end up landing on your feet and if you're not using your feet well how can you run better all right and uh, how can you be an elite athlete or even if you are maybe you're stopping shot you're stopping shot by say 10% uh, maybe there was more that you could have performed had those bones been working better there and you know whatever exercises are needed for it and all the power of sleep for example i mean these things excite me uh why does let's pick up someone like a fedra sleep a certain amount of time you know like 12 hours or whatever he does uh messi messi when he's on the field the amount of time that he walks on the field is crazy insane you know he's just walking up and down the field and then he scores a bloody goal right uh what's the science behind that right so it's actually very really between it it's so that's that's an integral part uh again at all times having fun so what we'll be doing is besides the whole education part i'll be putting together like there'll be a talk once a week about a topic so those topics are you know are there on the website i mean i can talk you through them uh but another day we'll be actually discussing about it so where you are the guys who are totally in charge i mean i'm just listening to you know whatever you picked up and what you thought about it and that again comes from the uk experience i had the nottingham experience because masters degree in our colleges is pretty much like a bachelor's it's nothing it's like you know you go to classes and you come out of classes and basically nothing seeps you know goes in it's about passing an exam uh whereas in in like the western world it's a lot about less classes absorb more kind of an approach so i want to kind of you know play around with that uh, with you guys where you talk amongst yourselves and you know think whatever was done again i repeat uh, yes we'll have some sort of mcqs and all don't worry about how hard core of an exam and all that not much uh get the basics right and you'll be solid uh the other component is through these three months it's a three month program you'll be on your journey of becoming a better you so if you are running at a certain space idea would be can you do it do it better if you're going to the gym can you do it better if you don't move yet can we get you moving uh, over the three months okay pain free with a smile being happy about it not being forced so that's the second component you'll be mentored for it okay and uh, the third component will be 
where you actually pick up four or five people. I would say five is the number that I'm looking at. Uh, family, friends, foes, you know, co-workers, whoever, whoever. And you become mentor to them. And uh, the reason for that is a very simple one. Uh, I found it very, very powerful. If you want to teach something, uh, if you want to good, become good at something, start teaching it, right? So if you want to really get on with this journey, uh, it's important that you start getting your spouse, your you know, kids, your parents, or whoever else, friends involved in it. And it'll surprise you how much change will happen to you first, okay? You're the mentor. Your basics will be questioned. And basics are the most difficult to answer, all right? Complicated stuff is very easy because when you are, you know, these Bitcoins, for example, I mean, who knows what it is, right? Uh, so it's, it's la la land, really. But when you ask about basic things, what is money? Uh, that's a little bit more tricky, right? So it's same thing. What happens with exercise, what happens with movement is, is not about how complicated the movement is. It's about how simple activity is done on a regular, regular basis. That, that's what the beauty is. And I think in today's world, the super, super specialization world, that's what is being missed out on. Again, so we'll go back to that. We'll take you through that. When you are asked that question, you'll come back. You'll be like, hey, listen, but I wasn't clear because of a certain thing. I might not have an answer. But the thing is, if you, even if you're thinking, if you're sitting together and having five theories about it, I think we are on the right track rather than saying we know it all. So I think this program will do great for you if you're ready to be a student. And if you think you're a guru, you see this is not for you because you know it's not for gurus at all. Uh, once you stop learning, it's game over, I think. So, and that's the beauty about running. You can never, never know it all. There's always so much more to do. And it surprises you every day. Uh, I mean, I end up running with random people sometimes, people I don't know, people I know, people who are, you know, I ran maybe 10 years ago at La Ultra, the very best that I've had from 24 countries it is, uh, I think. And phenomenal, the learnings that you have from them and the stories they tell you about the various races, uh, the different things they do. No one formula works for any of them. So putting all, it, all of it out there. Again, who else is this program for? Uh, maybe introductory program, uh, you know, course for them and uh, there'll be a lot more that we'll have to put in because this is very, very introductory. This is not yet very deep. But if you are keen on addressing pain as a therapist, uh, or if you're a doctor who is very keen on sports in sports medicine or, or pain management, conservative pain management, this could be a starting point because it'll surprise you. It'll be very basic and there'll be people who are not non-medics. But what I've learned is in programs like this, when you sit with non-medics, when you sit with people who aren't necessarily, in, at least for me, when they weren't sports medicine people or you know, whatever else, uh, the learning, because their perspective is very different. They think about it like a, almost a patient point of view. And we don't, we guys don't. As doctors, we, that's a very big issue. We don't. Uh, we sit from across the table point of view. Uh, that becomes a big issue. So it's a great learning, again, as a physio or a doctor who's already practicing. Uh, if you are keen on any of this, sports medicine or pain management, it'll be a lot of help uh, because the view would be very 360. You know, the power of mind, most people managing pain or most people talking about um, uh, athletics or sports, they're forgetting one or the other part. Whether either they're forgetting the mind or they're forgetting the body part, right? Uh, they don't appreciate enough. Uh, the thing that, not, I'm not saying I know it all, but uh, just that they don't know enough at all uh, to be in the position they end up being. It's always good to know more. Maybe I'll just help you scratch that little bit more, saying, oh, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a big, big space out there. Exercise psychology is a program, it's a, it's a field most people are not even aware of. Uh, I mean, I'm just getting to learn about it like the you know, last five, seven years that has been just really fascinating. Uh, most psychologists aren't trained about it, forget about a sports medicine doctor or a doctor at all. And that's such an important part. Uh, so we'll be dealing with that. We'll be talking about sleep, uh, you know, the women health. Uh, very important that we address that because to me, women are uh, the nucleus of the society. If we don't actually address that angle, uh, we'll not get very far. And, you know, I've just been very lucky that way that uh, I think Anurag will make fun of me forever after this, what I say. But most of the ladies, most of the programs I've run, primarily they end up being ladies. So the questions that I'm asked are a lot more about women related. Uh, so it's not about my own personal experience, but I've dealt with a lot of them. So I would 
you know, maybe I'll have an answer to various situations. Uh, I'll give you a very random one. Uh, there's something called female athlete triad, where, uh, you know, the girl, it's actually not only limited to female, by the way, it could be men, men as well, that they're never thin enough. So it starts from there. So it's a very psychological thing. Doctors would think of it like a very physical thing. It's a very psychological thing. You, know, you can't be thin enough. And they have eating disorder. And on top of that, their periods are not doing well. They're all over the place. And on top of that, their bones are very weak, of course. And it's a disaster. Most people are missing it totally. And, and they're suicidal also. It can be. Now, there are such simple ones, low-hanging fruits, that we are missing out in our families. I'm not trying to make you a doctor with all of this, but you know the idea is really touching such topics, making you just aware. Another one with women is, uh, and probably Anurag will, will agree with me, with me on this one, is uh, PCODs, polycystic ovarian disease and syndromes. When we were doing MBBS, it was part of the, you know, the whole subject called obstetrics and gynecology, but we didn't see these patients. Uh, and today, every third, every fourth girl has it. And, uh, you know, lifestyle is one very big reason for it. I mean, whoever, whichever gynecologist I've spoken to, they're like, it's not about drugs. It's about get sought out your lifestyle. You know, I mean, the good ones that I end up talking to. So we'll be touching such things. And elderly, uh, from the time we are born, we are told, you know, you're, how old are you? Are you one day old? Are you 10 days old? Are you 10 years old? So from the time we are born, we're told that, you know, we're getting old. Uh, and that, I think, is a cultural thing. and that's. I mean, I don't know about, you know, Anurag and I can probably have a conversation about this later, but the way we approach it, we are telling someone that can't be, you know, they can't be doing anything after a certain age. I mean, they're being, it's in, in being enforced without being thought about too much. Uh, and that's an issue because by the time someone's 60, they're thinking that it's end of the game, like, you know, end of everything. And that's yet again, a very important part. Um, again, program totally for, uh, you know, housewives, um, it could be, again, anyone of you who, you know, the way they are treated, especially in the Indian culture, the point is they're 24-7 workers, right? They're working their butts off all the time. And, and they would think, and you would think, because they're physically working, they are doing whatever, that they're healthy. They're not, because they're not doing it the right way. They're not looking at sleep enough. And if you don't sleep well, you've got problems. And if mental health is not looked at, you've got problems. So I'll be touching on all that stuff. And again... That's that's about it. Um, Anurag, any questions? Maybe I've missed. Oh, I think well said. Yeah. And a good introduction to the course. And you know, you started. You traced the arc of running away from pain, uh, from that stick on your backside, to running uh, towards pain. And what struck me was, you know, I think you said this inadvertently. It says, how do you strength? When you were talking about Kaiser training, essentially, I suspect you meant, how do you do? How do you become stronger? But I think uh, this phrase struck me because it it is kind of a different take on strength. What what occurred to me was, how do you pain? You know, it is very similar to how do you run. If you know how do you pay, you know how do you run, and you know actually most of the things in life, I suspect. And so when you started, I think, running away from pain and then towards pain, till you were running with you know, your pain, it became a different thing, I think. It became a different experience is what I can guess. I've never reached there, but that's my suspicion that you are running pain, as people run a fever. It's interesting you say that. So when it comes to ultra running for actually marathon also, right? Or, or running, uh, why even ultra running or marathon? Uh, effectively, you have these waves. You have these, uh, you know, runner's high, for example. Now, people who experienced it, it's like any high or bigger than any high. So you suddenly get to a zone where you don't feel it where what's happening is you're just in the right zone and you can be running at just the right pace and not getting breathless at all. And that, that uh, phase could be there like for a five minutes, could be 10 minutes, could be an hour actually, depending on what distance you are running at. If it's an ultramarathon, obviously it can be an hour as well. 
that is what we run for, to just be in the Zen zone almost. And uh, it happens after having gone through the pain. So you kind of graduated out of it kind of a thing. You're in that stratosphere type of space. So that's one part of it. The other part actually is, you know, what you actually just said, uh, or alluded to at least. Um, so pain, a lot of us are, when we run, when we do things, we struggle, we make too much effort to do it. And that's the thing again, once we are starting to get into that space about, let's be very, I keep using the term, let go and you know, be easy on your feet and be soft on your feet and all that. Uh, this life has taught us to resist too much and letting go is the trick there. So once that relationship with pain is starting to happen, uh, it's a very interesting one because suddenly it's not painful anymore. Uh, it's it's a bit it's a similar thing between you know the way it is between uh, uh, loneliness and al alone. So you don't have to be lonely to be alone. I mean you can enjoy your company. Uh, so it's a bit like that when it comes to running and pain. I remember this uh, small story which I read a long time ago. It was called the loneliness of the long distance runner. It could very well have been the painfulness or the painliness, if there is such a word, of the long distance runner. Yeah. Because when you run long distance, as or so I gather, your pain runs with you. And sometimes you and the pain merge, and sometimes it runs besides you. Yeah. Uh, this is my sense, though I've never reached that place myself. <laughs> but enough of me. Uh, uh, I, I mean, if anybody else wants to say, um, anything or ask a question, a question. please uh, feel free. Bill. Okay. Well, first, first, I have two questions, but first I want to say that was a very excellent presentation. I, I don't know anybody more passionate about the science of, of running than you are. Um, I, I, my questions, one, one's related to pain. Um, one is, um, like when, when, when you're running and you start feeling pain or have an injury coming along, do you, do you think in terms of recovery, is it better to stop running, walk, run slow? What is, any, any advice there? And then I'll ask my second question. Uh, Bill, awesome. I mean, uh, I don't even know how to answer this one for you actually. <laughs> uh, hi, first of all, hi. <laughs> all right, so uh, Bill, when it comes to, but what were the two questions? So you said two things, right? So I said one question so far, but I have another yeah, question. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So, so when it comes to pain, my simple thing is actually listen to it, slow down. Uh, a lot of times, most of my colleagues end up saying, if it's hurting, it's a bad thing. Uh, I don't think it is. Uh, most of the times, it's actually not. Uh, so you have to kind of figure out what that zone is. And uh, I think it's a journey. So I would say for someone like you, someone like me, who's been at it for a while, we understand our bodies differently versus someone who's just picked it up. Now, someone I deal now, for some time now, I've been dealing with a lot of people who are just beginning off. Now, for them, I would say you back off. So there would be good days, there'll be bad days, especially if you're starting from the very beginning, uh, like it's your day zero, day one, and everything will hurt. And you know what? It's totally fine because it's like going on the first day and doing gym exercises. Of course, it'll hurt. You have not done it for a while. It could have been 10 years or five years or whatever. Maybe you need to rest a little bit and you know revisit not the next day, maybe the third day. I don't know. Uh, maybe in between, do a walk. And I, Bill, I've become very. Uh, I really started liking this term called active rest. So rather than taking a total day off, uh, you know the things that you've been doing, the two kilometer walk, you know the runs that are happening, and I would end up calling them or the walk as an active rest, saying you don't have to take total total time off. Uh, and that becomes a very important part as yeah. a base that I found as a recovery. And this comes from uh, the change in sports medicine. We used to have the term called price earlier, uh, prevention, rest, ice, compression, elevation. And then it changed to police. Uh, it seems like a very wrong way to approach it, police, but uh, OL was optimal loading. So rest was removed totally from it. So when it comes to sports recovery, rehabilitation, rest is out of it. Now, optimal loading, how do you define it? Optimal loading basically is not about at all bed rest. And that's something that, you know, as a back pain is a big one. Uh, I mean, I don't want to go too deep into the history of back pain, but it's the wrong advice we've been giving to our clients or patients about bed rest. 
if you can move, you need to be moving. With Kizer, the advantage was we were getting people after surgeries, after a few days after surgeries, and they were doing 100 kgs, lumbers, extensions, and all that stuff. I mean, you know, crazy stuff like that. Uh, or you would think crazy. But it was so controlled. So slow, controlled movement is very important. So I think optimal loading, even if there's pain, just slow down. Uh, you don't have to totally take off time off. See how it's behaving. If the pain gets worse, so you, so you attempt it a few times. You see how you're going. And again, this would could be different in different situations. If it's an ultra marathon, it's a different story altogether. Uh, but if someone's running on a regular basis, um, I would say just kind of listen to your body first. And Bill, uh, I always tell people, to you, you're your hundred percent. Whereas to the doctor who could have had 30 years of experience and maybe has a few degrees and, you know, maybe he's a runner or not. The point is you're one of the 20,000 or 30,000 or, you know, 100,000 that he's seeing. So you're, you're a percentage. It's a percentage game that's on. It's statistics. Uh, so that's a very interesting way to think about it. Listen to the doctor, but do what feels right. Uh, I think it's a very important part. But you have to kind of have evolved as a runner to get that feel. What is what is right or not. Excellent. Okay. My second question, um, this has this has nothing to do with pain, but it's when you do slow down, <clears throat> I, I often like if I'm running with a bunch of people and I, I suddenly slow down because my knees hurt or something like that. People will say, well, you're not running anymore because running means there's a phase where both feet are off the ground. OK, and I, I know there's a really big difference between slow running and walking. So do you have a good definition for running? Because I don't believe that definition of running that both feet have to be off the ground. Uh, I totally agree with you, Bill. So a lot of people have a pace, like, you know, what speed are you at to kind of define if it's actually running or if it's walking? That's one thing. And the other one is this whole thing about both feet on the ground or not. Um, people like you and me, again, I mean, because I, I know you're running, I've, I've seen you run, and, you know, me as well. Uh, a lot of times when I'm in my zone, and I could be running quick, by the way. So speed has nothing to do with it. Uh, but there are times when it seems like it's actually a walk. It's like a speed walk rather than actually a run. Uh, and, you know, it kind of, that whole biomechanics thing is out of the window suddenly. It's like, I know what I'm doing, all right? It is not walking. And what, I, what I've learned over time is in dealing with people of all kinds, really, you know, from big nurse or whoever else, who are we to define such things at times? Uh, so, you know, if it feels like, hey, listen, you know, I'm here, I am running, uh, so be it. And again, about La Ultra, for example, one thing that I was getting in the very beginning was, you know, but we don't see pictures of these guys running. I'm like, yeah, yeah, come along and, you know, why don't you attempt it? <laughs> so that's been something very regular I got there. And you know what? I mean, I think, Bill, after a while now, you don't, you don't really care too much about <laughs> what other people think. You're like, listen, I know what I'm doing. It's okay. You know, I don't have to convince you about it. <laughs> next, next time I'm, so somebody says that, I'm going to say, well, I think I'm running. <laughs> and yeah, that. yeah, yeah. That's all I got. Thanks. Philip. Um, anyone else? You just you can just unmute your microphone and say whatever you would like. Preferably put on the video as well. Sudhir. Hi, 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 Sudhir. Just put on the camera as well, please, Sudhir. Oh, I'm really sorry, but yes, okay. <laughs> That's okay. <Go> on. <laughs> we all are at home, so you can understand why I'm not really well, well, so, sir, a very good evening. First of all, thanks for this uh, lovely uh, introduction about the course. Uh, but still, uh, I would. Uh, uh, it's my interesting question, you can say. Still, I'm searching what actually you're going to teach in that particular course you're talking about for three months. See, I'm a sports physiotherapist, and in my regular professional routine, as you know very well, that we are already serving for the athletes, for the runners, for the jumpers, for each and every kind of athletes we are serving already. And we always search uh, the reason behind the, uh, the pain, we always treat reason behind of course no we have a uh, senior doctors as well they always do the uh, diagnose uh, about the re, uh, condition of the athlete 
and the things what you are talking talking about even the female trial we always look after for that thing even the sports psychology nutrition everything we look after then after we go for the rehabilitation we make a particular protocol and then follow the things how it should be done so uh, apart in that what would be the specialty of this course if i uh, uh, hang you here i am going to learn about this thing yeah so there so primarily as i said uh, it's not necessarily for doctors or physios who especially are into the space uh, so there it could be someone who's keen on it or wants to be exposed to the whole thing like a 360 view uh, so that's one thing second is really as much as we think that we're doing looking at the whole picture and all that uh, what tends to happen is are we really looking at everything together you know so it's easier said you know there's the whole team uh i'll tell you every time from the very first day at a medical college we, i already always had the whole team and then i went on to doing the next thing and there was the whole team and the whole team and the whole team so over like next 20 years there were whole teams and then when i look back at it the whole w was missing and the hole was there so it was a whole throughout okay so we weren't looking at the whole picture right so idea is how to get you know yourself uh, the knowledge of saying can i can i have the 360 view so can i be the one person saying who has that psychology angle as well can i have that athlete's point of view uh, can i appreciate about um, the whole you know sleep angle for example you know like how important a role does that play nutrition how long, uh, important a role does that play when i touched on the female athlete trial right, that wasn't for some kid addressing you I and mean, you know it that's that's part of the curriculum right but but a regular joe uh, someone who hasn't been to physio or you know sports medicine or whatever uh that's unique that's that's not something that you hear every day right so when you hear of pcod or pcos i mean uh, a regular chap they have no business knowing it i agree right uh, as a physio i'll give you something very interesting which orthopedists are trained in even today uh, is something very basic for a physio iliotibial band okay now most orthopedists would treat it as a knee arthritis it'll be treated as a knee, knee oa rather than saying there's a, a iliotibial band syndrome going on even today right yeah. after very, all this yeah very. so i think what this does this gives you a very holistic view of how to be approaching it like i'll give you a very standard so the how long do you spend with your patient in uh, for taking the history so uh, it, it 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 is very deep and i usually uh, spend almost uh you cannot say that in in one setting you can understand that thing what is going on how long at least how long? Yeah, at least at least, <laughs> at least half an hour you can say so so i'll tell you the longer the case being you know the history being if you end up being like a 45 minutes to an hour you'll be surprised what tends to happen they start opening up okay and i'm saying only history by the way i'm not saying the whole consultation yeah. okay i'm only saying history so when when you've done that bit and again you know uh, anurag is here and he's in the space of whole listening really right i mean he's the psychologist psychiatrist and all that stuff right um or psychoanalyst so what happens is that's the power of just listening when you listen the client who's come to you or the patient who's come to you they start giving you answers and you don't have to say a word most of the times and you're like by the way you know i know what to do now all right uh so idea is touching these bases these very simple ones that somehow our system has missed on all right um and the best of us you know we're not addressing it as i said because i did it in reverse order uh because something similar to physio i was doing in the third degree or the second maybe a little bit right uh and the fourth when when i did kizo was more of you know what um, physios do or don't or whatever uh manual therapy which suddenly has got a very bad name uh in in the physiotherapy world right earlier every physio wanted to learn it and suddenly you know it's supposed to be the worst thing in the world uh i think there's no good or bad i think the idea is every patient is different uh you need to take culture into account um if something is going to work for that client why not you need to be aware of that and i think as soon as we say we know it all we we are in trouble Uh, so, so I got your idea. So basically, so for more of your sharing of your experience, what you have learned, how to deal with the patient, not only physically or with the investigation and examination, more of the more of the psychology actually as well. This, more of the clinical practice. This particular course is basically for saying, take proactive in charge, be in charge of your own body, 
rather than outsourcing it to the physio or the doctor, whoever else, because it's your body, it's your life, all right? Great, listen to them, listen to their expertise. They don't know you as well as you do, but first you need to know what you don't know, right? Yeah. And you need to be doing that. This particular program, as I said, is more for them. It's, for, it's almost like a pre-med actually. So if someone is keen on doing medicine, they should be, you know, be a part of this program saying, what would medicine probably be? Or what should it possibly be? Because the problem today with physiotherapy or medicine is we get into those fields without knowing what they are. We just aspire to become like uncles or whatever, aunts and all that or whoever else uh, without knowing anything about it. And without knowing the good or the bad and the ugly and all that stuff, which you know our field is all about. Uh, so it could be a great one for them. It could be good for someone who's wanting to become better. It could be for trainers, for example. I'll tell you where, I mean, where it really fits in. And I was sharing earlier with Anora. This really fits into, imagine this is where healthcare is. Imagine this is where fitness is. Now, healthcare is not about healthcare at all. There's no health and care if you think about it. If you step back and be very unbiased about it, okay? Uh, it's illness and sickness. Exactly. Right? And care, we know how much there is. So let's not even argue on that, right? So let's not get all emotional because you're of a particular field that how much care. I mean, come on. Uh, we know. Uh, so there's no health and care in the healthcare industry, right? Then we talk fitness industry. What is there in fitness industry? It's, it's about going to the gym and muscles. It's about running a marathon in a certain time. And that's about it. We are missing out on 99% of the population between the two of them, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say, can I talk to those people and connect the two, bring those two together as well, saying those doctors should know about the fitness and those fitness people need to know about medicine. Let's bring them together. Uh, so it's trying to cover that area, really. Okay. Fine. Fine. Thank yeah. you so much for the explanation. Uh, I really appreciate it. Pleasure, Shubhu. Anybody else? Look, the one thing which I think connects both healthcare and fitness and I am sounding like a broken record, is, is pay. Your, your willingness to take it on, you're suffering from it, you're trying to deal with it, it lies at the center of, I think, both, uh, both these experiences. But anyway, that's me. Anybody else <laughs> wants to say anything? I'll give it a few more seconds. If nobody wants to say anything, then we'll stop for today. Yeah, it's been an hour. It's been an hour. I see Vivek Kocher's video. I think he wants to say something. Yeah. Hi, hey, good evening, sir. How are you? Hi, Vivek. Hi, good evening. Thanks. How are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, uh, I'm new to running. Like uh, you can say, I've not been into sports and. Uh, never done any of the physical activities. Uh, only started with the cycling a few years back. Yeah, I do cycling and walking. So cycling, I do cycle for say, ride for a few hours, but maybe one or two. I'm not extensively, I'm extensive as I into sports or something. But uh, I'm willing to <laughs> start something. Uh, but uh, that's how, that's all. Like, I don't know how to go get it done. Sus, as I said, you in prerequisite, kaise karna So Vivek, yeah. So actually interesting you asked this. Uh, so you have just come out with a book today only. Uh, it's called La Ultra, Couch to 5, 11, 22 kilometers in 100 days. Now, again, this is kind of touching on, you know, Bill's point as well. Um, if you want to run, please don't start with running. Okay, uh, the very simple thing is start with walking. Time on feet becomes very important, all right? Optimal loading I was touching on earlier becomes very, very important part because if you start running day one after not having done it for 20 years, 30 years in between, trust me, that's a recipe for disaster. Then you'll be looking for appointment with someone like me rather than just saying, you know, how do I run? So I think that's an important part, time on feet. Don't worry about, for running, don't run. I mean, that's a very simple thing. If you want to become fast at something, uh, there's a movie called Shooter. I mean, it's a very, I really love that uh, one dialogue. Uh, 
slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So I'll repeat that. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So learn to become smooth rather than thinking about slow or fast, right? Uh, so idea is just spend more time out there. As much as cycling you do, you'll be surprised in, in physiology when we look at, say, the muscle strength, for example, uh, like a biceps. When we make someone stand up and do a bicep curl versus when they sit down and do it, surprise, surprise, the muscle works differently. The weight you can lift at a certain time is different. And it's based on whatever you're used to. It's not even based on standing or st sitting. It's based on whatever you're used to. So you could be doing very well sitting down on the bike and you know doing three hours or whatever you're doing, all right? And when you come to running, suddenly you're struggling. Put yourself in the pool, swimming pool, and maybe one you know uh, bit and you're done, right? One length you're done. Uh, so it's very specific to the physical activity you're used to, okay? Uh, so that endurance you have. Let's just get it out there saying time on feet, okay? Baby steps, we then start doing the, uh, in an order where we say, listen, let's do five minutes of walk, 30 seconds of a runnish kind of a thing, jog or whatever, uh, slightly faster movement, okay? And then we start reversing that. We start making longer of a run uh, you know, duration and uh, lesser of the walk, okay? So over time, it's reversing. And uh, within two, three months, you kind of now are doing more of run and very little of uh, walking in between. And within three months, it's you laid such a solid foundation. You're not going to get hurt with that. If you're going to, you know, there's a problem with the lockdown and all that, that, hey, in three months, I've done a half marathon or a full marathon and you know, all that. Good for you. The thing is, it's an amazing hobby you have picked. Why are you wanting to do it so quick? You know, pick it up for life. Yeah. So, so I think, I think, if you just follow that, you'll do very well. Don't worry about the rat race that who has done what, you know, if you're enjoying it. I mean, one thing that I didn't touch throughout, the happiness that, you know, the joy of running uh, is a very, very important part. Uh, if you don't have that, you're missing the point. Uh, so I, I think do it for that. And don't worry about the distances. They'll come. They'll be a good byproduct. All of them will come. And you'll become faster. Thank you. <laughs> Looking forward for it, sir. Pleasure, sir. Pleasure. Thank you should. Always, there's a saying that, you know, you always overestimate what you can do in the short term and underestimate what you can do <laughs> in the long term. It, I think it applies across all aspects of one's life. I think Mr. Viron, Varun Keval might want to speak. Varun, do you want to say something? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. Yeah, Rajat sir, I have been following you for quite some time now, and uh, I got to know about you through the account of Sandeep Mall, sir. I mean, wherein right. you had one video session. So I really liked, I mean, the information that you gave in over there. Talking about myself, sir, like I used to be 110 kg seven, eight months back. And, you know, hearing your conversations and following other accounts on social media, today I have lost almost 40 kgs of weight. Very good. And like, as you said, I mean, I, initially I was very heavy. So running and all that used to be very difficult. I mean, running even for 100 meters, that used to be a bit challenge. So I started like with walking and cycling. But for the last seven or eight months, sir, like I have been running five days a week, uh, seven to eight kilometers per day. So uh, normally I have been doing fine. But what I have noticed is like, you know, every two or three months, you know, I, I will develop pains in some body part, maybe ankles or knees. Yeah. Although I haven't stopped running or, you know, doing my workouts, because what I have found that eventually, eventually those pains go away. But uh, I mean, when I do those things, I really don't understand as to what wrong have I done because I have been following that routine. But still those things, you know, keep appearing. And in this process, a couple of months back, I ended up buying your book, that pain handbook. Okay, so I ended up buying that also. But I mean, uh, given the uh, 
time and the effort and you know mental energy that i have invested into this running kind of thing you know uh, i just want to pursue it for life long right matlab ye hai ki bhai zinda rehna hai to ye to karna hi hai because when i was my, my bmi used to be 38 39 i developed a few medical conditions also so i just you know dread that kind of life i used to have तो ये जो बीच बीच में पेन शुरू हो जाता है कहीं पे भी विच अकॉर्डिंग टू मी दैट आई एम नॉट डूइंग एक्सेसिव रनिंग टू फास्ट और टू मच लॉन्ग डिस्टेंसेस तीन दिन करता हूँ एक दिन रेस्ट लेता हूँ वॉक करता हूँ मॉर्निंग में फिर दो दिन करूंगा फिर एक दिन का रेस्ट लेता हूँ बट एवरी टू मंथ्स और थ्री मंथ्स यू नो दिस निगल्स दे डेवलप सो विवेक दिस इज this is the one part that i didn't touch on and you know anurag kind of did say a little about it so uh, strength training as much as i am a runner and talk about running all the time and all that stuff and um, strength training is more important than running itself okay so when you start losing weight the and again this is going back to you know just the quote that uh, uh, anurag was alluding to right now the long term short term you know how we underestimate or estimate them so when you talk about weight loss the first bit the first 20 kg the first 25 kg or even 30 or whatever are the easier bit okay the second part to after that is the whole plateauing and getting better and healthier that is the trickier part because now the job becomes difficult the results are slower okay so it's not going to be the same quick thing that you know every day you, there's a kg off and all that i mean i'm overrating or you know over is saying a little bit too much about that but uh it's not going to be as quick it's starting to plateau off okay the you really need to understand one thing about obesity is the frame the body frame that is there the skeleton is not necessarily very big of someone who's obese or overweight okay so the bones are weak they are weak because of the nutrition they are having and the load that they have to carry they be feeling more pain uh your you know bone densitometry would not be very good all that stuff okay you've done your uh, um so you've yeah. done yeah kuldeep so when you've actually uh, done all that running uh and haven't done strength training your bones haven't become stronger so what's very important we make is work with your strength training okay? okay um and that's very important start also looking at your heart rate your resting heart rate for example you know how's your resting heart rate and again that's separate you know we can talk about that but seriously start doing strength training spend two days a week doing strength training of good quality okay uh work with that uh diet i mean you know enough about diet and hence you got where we got so far but idea is not to cut down on the calories it's about having the right calories i think that's a very important point to take home okay because mistake people make is they just start eating very little uh a body requires a certain amount of you know like um, food but is it the right kind of stuff that's that's an important one you need to address so please start doing strength training uh get your vitamin d3 uh, measured uh, so okay. that's a very very important one yeah okay thank you thank you sir pleasure i think i think nikita has a question uh, something about do you see it rajat no i do i something popped up in an off air i don't just look at your messages <laughs> on look at the chat board. look at I'm, the I'm, chat yeah yeah, yeah so sure Nikita, can you come on and ask your question? Yeah. Hi. Good evening. I can. Um, yeah. 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 So I think the same problem he uh, shared with all of us. So I think I have the same issue with injuries. Like, it's been some two to two and a half years with running, and uh, I face this injury problem, and then again I have to go back to you know the normal stage, and then getting back to running. Then that whole phase, you know, is really. <laughs> difficult so if you could just share some exercises or some things which can enhance that nikita so just give me a little bit more how much how long you been running for what distance is what speed uh, so um uh, what are you asking sorry the distance yeah what distances do you run how long you been running for uh, so okay so i was really into long distance like before this covid came in but after the covid i am facing some breath 
listeners issues and together with rajat and bill around you never say things like long distance <laughs> <laughs> i know i know i've been following his twitter and everything so long. <laughs> and <laughs> and how, how long nikita how long okay how long so the longest i've run till date is probably somewhere around 36.8 some something that distance so like i'm really looking forward to like sustain you know that much distance and not focus on speed and focus on the distance so yeah <laughs> so so nikita uh, okay so okay i'll i'll try answering and um yeah. okay so so the thing is simple things don't necessarily mean that they're not thought through okay so exactly. the the okay. thing that keeps us alive for example is breathing now someone could say but yeah i mean wo to pata hai right uh yeah right so why don't you do it so the thing is with that running that's the beauty of it but the solution right. is almost always simple rather than complicated all right uh, okay. so what you ta- what you're talking about vivek are talking about and what i like about common between the two of you is uh, you want to do it for life rather than saying you know this is the fad of the season kind of a thing okay so that's beautiful because the problem with i have with most runners is that we know what we are doing and you know nothing will ever go wrong and that's the worst way we are worst approach to have um uh, slow down uh, when i say slow down i'm not saying speed i'm saying your plan why is you need to figure uh, have a little bit of a strategy like what's going on how do you want to approach it okay when you say breathlessness um covid has been interesting for most runners from one perspective at least as far as people who are in touch with me the respirometers that are there i don't have a respirometer right next to me do you know what a respirometer is i do know but again you know when one i second. start i just running... i'll just i'll just get it one second hold on yeah. or maybe not my my we're in respirometer log but so i'll just tell you something yeah. so when i started running i picked up this board just because it has you know very less complicated stuff like you just have to have a pair of running shoes and probably a running belt to hold your phone and then you can just do whatever you want Nik- nikita, so i don't want to complicate it with a lot nikita, of gadgets around me that's 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 what it is uh, bill bill is just the right person to say a lot more on this but uh, running is about that running is about why the apple watch and why the whatever else it's good to have those toys with you yeah. but you know you should not be a servant to them right exactly. they should be your servants kind of a thing yeah. technology always should be your servant okay uh, so so the thing is i i wear shoes i should not be saying this because this some people might take it to the other extreme but i'll say it <laughs> uh, the shoes i wear uh, i used to be a principal consultant to adidas india running uh, i don't know when it was some 6 years ago or something so i got some free gear from them the shoes i wear are from that time long ago uh, just that the newer i did not use them for all this while and then i only use them for two years now two years is too much uh, and they don't have laces for example so they are those slip on shoes and i can run fast with them i can run slow and i love them so i'm saying how basic i don't wear a watch okay uh, i wear your basic old t-shirts from whenever unless i get new one done for my next event or something i test them out uh, shorts again oldish ones all i'm trying to tell you is no they don't have to be more than that uh, you're totally fine if you're wearing a basic sh- pair of shoes a uh, shorts t-shirt or some sort you're doing totally fine don't worry about making it complicated okay i think what goes wrong is when you're trying to put in too much effort all right and again bill and i was just talking about that be soft on your feet uh, seems easy to talk about it most people don't get it even in 10 years what that means start skipping okay uh nikita so that's one exercise i would suggest for you skipping is very powerful for a runner start start doing that right i started you... that the skipping and the squat thing so yeah and yeah. exactly squats squats are very easy anyone and everyone can do as much as half the people say that they do, can't uh everyone can mm-hmm. because you sit down and you get up right in a day that's a squat right. that's half a squat yeah, i mean that's uh, a very basic exercise yes. that everyone can do precisely my point so so yeah. start investing in a little bit strength training uh yeah. I, i always say if running is your love your strength training is your father or mother in law kind of a thing okay you might not like But them do you also do. think that people like runners uh, 
lack in the kind of guidance they should get i mean i've tried to connect with people like two three coaches so i mean they tell me a bit about all these gadgets and probably own a pair of nice ultra boost or something i mean how uh, expensive it can get so about Nikita, that. tell me tell me one thing if you okay. if you and i'm just using you as an example okay so okay. if you don't know how to drive okay yeah. and i tell you get a porsche because you'll become a better driver I mean, does that make sense? No, right? no, that does not, right? Precisely. And all the technology, I can tell you, like, hey, this is what it is, and you know, I can tell you all the, you know, the heritage and the legacy and all that. Uh, how does it matter? It's about you. It's about that operator there, right? Running is as simple as you know, as a child. Remember that. You, I mean, you won't remember. I won't remember either. As a one and a, one and a half years old or two year old who care, you know, totally carefree was running from left to right and you know wherever jumping around wherever. That was beautiful, right? Now that's what running should be. Yeah. Right. It's not about learning how to run. It's about relearning how to run. Okay. Exactly. And and you have to be the one relearning. I mean, someone like me is just a guide. My problem with most coaches, I'm sorry for putting it out there like that. <laughs> uh, you know. the problem is having done half one half or whatever even 100 halves or fulls or ultras how do i get you know we have to put ourselves in those shoes of other person and if you don't you're missing the point uh and i think that's very important as a coach or a trainer or a mentor i like if at all i like, like to call myself a mentor or a coach at all but uh, i think we should be giving basic guidance at the end of the day you have to get up in the morning and move uh and can we give the right ones the basic right. ones rather than complicating it because it's very really easy to complicate by the way it's very very easy uh simple is difficult by the way right exactly <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I mean, thank I think you for this push. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pleasure, pleasure. But you know, uh, there are videos that I have. More than happy, just go check them out. There's a book that, as I, as I said, and uh, whatever. Uh, so you can catch up separately as well. Uh, but I think just focus on strength training. Uh, don't you mentioned about speed? Don't focus on speed right now. Hmm. Uh, focus on being soft. Okay. Yeah. When you are soft, as I said, you know, slow is smooth. Smooth is fast. you'll surprise yourself you'll be shaving off a minute per kilometer if you start learning how to be soft okay so if if speed gives you the kicks in some time you will become quick but don't don't make it the first point right okay okay right. Rajat, before you become the karate kid <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Selling grasshoppers or what was it? I think all of us are getting up in the morning just for that run. I mean, about all the motivation we've got. So. Yeah. So let's learn last question from Kuldeep Daya, and then we should stop after that. I think. Yeah. Ah, super. Yeah. Kuldeep, you had a question, I think. He left. Yeah. Come on, you totally bullied him out of this. No, no. Like, can I ask wrote... question? Can if he's not asking? Yeah, yeah. Please. Okay, so Dipta, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, Doctor Chauhan, you mentioned about resting heart rate, right? So, what's like, uh, if you could just throw some light as to what uh, is a, I know it depends and all that stuff, right? Age and what's the no, what's the you know the ballpark or the good, bad? I mean, you know, any any anything on resting heart rate. So, first of all, for measuring resting heart rate, this is the these are the tools you need. All right you can measure it uh, we've been doing it for a while you know medical fertility right uh, so so one is you do not need to invest if you want to do resting heart rate if you don't want to that is okay uh, now everyone's talking about the maximum heart rate without understanding if you are see at the end of the day heart is uh, you know like it's a pump right if it can't do the basics right and you want to see what the max is you in trouble you don't know what the basic is right i mean you should do the baseline first right and that's what a resting heart rate is it's first thing in the morning you should be measuring it so how i like to do it is uh when you get up in the morning uh you know go to the loo come back sit down uh measure that heart uh, heart rate after say 2 3 minutes of having rested okay keep recording it on a regular basis at the standard time keeping the same routine don't change it every time because you messed it up uh, as soon as you change a routine if you're doing it after say push ups and squats say one day and one day after 
after a run one day after just having got up come on you messed it up so it has to be standardized that whole thing so once you've actually done that uh now you are getting an idea of what your number is like a resting heart rate and measure it for a month okay uh keep a record in that excel sheet or the you know piece of paper that you're recording on uh, the day before what all things you did so physically what efforts were done how much did you run and stuff like that um then also actually psychologically wise emotion wise what was it like what did you eat what time did you sleep now idea is that with having done this you you start figuring out what days your your uh, resting heart rate is a little higher is a little lower it'll start answering that for you automatically right you asked me about the numbers um uh, there are no numbers i mean you know uh, we have we've had very low numbers in you know mid 30s uh for resting heart rate and even a 70 is normal uh for some okay so it's a very wide range it's become uh from some time back when not enough people were exercising uh early of 40 45 the cardiologist would have had a stroke or a you know a heart attack themselves actually uh, looking at those numbers but today we see that those numbers are very common amongst runners you know like a 40 ish is expected okay 60 65 very expected in a you know a sporty person so that's your resting heart rate uh to think that a certain number is better than the other is the wrong way to approach it so yeah that's that's the best i can really give you really and it's it's far more important than the maximum heart rate i like working with resting heart rate a lot more thank you thank you dhaiya ji kuldeep go ahead I think he typed his question. Uh, I have injuries in toe due to running. I don't know. Maybe you want to answer his. See the chat. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying. I think his video or audio is getting stuck. Cut. Hello. Huh? Hanji, Hanji. Hello. Hello. Sir, मुझे injury हुई. Sir, मैं running कर रहा था. Hanji, कहाँ injury हुई? Sir, injury तो होता है तो. घुटने तक जा रहा है तो कि किस किस्म से हो रहा है किस वजह से हो रहा है मैं बता रहा हूँ क्या क्या हो सकता है एक बड़ा सिंपल जो लोग मिस आउट कर देते हैं जब इस तरह का दर्द होता है की कमर से तो नहीं आ रहा कहीं आपको लग रहा है की सिर्फ पैर में है पर कई बार होता है कहीं कमर से तो नहीं आ रहा ठीक है कि नस तो नहीं रवी हुई दूसरा है मसल्स के क्या हाल हैं जैसे हैमस्टिंग हो गई जो काफ मसल्स हो गई तीसरा जो जूते हैं कहीं टाइट है नहीं है कब चोट लगी थी किस लिए लगी थी ट्विस्ट तो नहीं हुआ कहीं तो वो सारा ना मतलब फिजिकली एग्जामिन करके ही पता चलेगा क्योंकि बड़ा स्पेसिफिक बात है कि भाई टो में दर्द है चोट लगी है रनिंग करते हुए वो बहुत ही ज्यादा स्पेसिफिक हो जाता है फिर देखने के लिए समझने के लिए कि क्या हो रहा है क्यों हो रहा है आई थिंक शायद बेहतर होगा कि आप उनसे पर्सनली मुलाकात करें तो ज्यादा बेहतर होगा कुलदीप या कोई भी जो फिजियो वगैरह है ना आपके आसपास क्योंकि एक तो मेरे को पकड़ना ही बड़ा मुश्किल है तो जो भी आपके रेगुलर अड़ोस पड़ोस में जो भी हैं पर पर्सनली आपको मिलना ही पड़ेगा किसी से ऐसे होगा नहीं इसका इग्नोर ना करें आप इसको इग्नोर ना करें प्लीज अनूप डू यू वॉन्ट टू से समथिंग Okay, so I think we are excellent to conversation. A... I must, I must say, I must uh, really. Thanks, sir. Rajat, Rajat is an excellent speaker as well. He he inspires, and uh, I was just listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listening. <laughs> Thank you. Listening. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Same here. Thank you so much, Ayesha. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Shri. So we've got at least three professors. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> Thank you, Doctor Chauhan. Thank you, Ram. Thanks. Sorry, four. Sorry, four <laughs> professors. I forgot <laughs> Sonali. Beautiful. <laughs> no. So thank you, Rajat. And for anybody who needs more information, you can go to the website which is on the chat: liilr. dot livonics. dot com. and if you missed out part of the lecture i'll post it on the website in a day or two 
So look forward to seeing you all at some point or the other, somewhere or the other. And if you found what Rajat had to say was interesting and you want to pursue it, and if you want to work with us, God forbid, then uh, please uh, you know enroll for the course and uh, we'll see you there. Thank you, Anurag. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. Good evening and goodbye. Bye. Bye, everyone.